Welcome back to the Final Five. We are continuing our conversation with many of the candidates for president in 2024. That includes my guest tonight. You may recognize him from his appearances on Fox News or from the radio or from his run for governor in California. He is Larry Elder, up late with me tonight on the Final Five. Uh, sir, we, we were looking forward to having you on the show. Really glad we made this happen. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You know, for, for somebody, first of all, you you have worked on the media end of things for years and years and years, uh, but you you jumped into the political waters in California, and, and you, you're staying in those waters right now. What's the motivation? What What's different from, from talking about politics to being part of it? The whole different ballgame, obviously. I, I never thought I'd run for anything. I ran for third grade class president. Before you ask me, yes, I won that one, so I'm betting 500. I did it because I really felt that I had a shot at maybe becoming governor of California in a recall election. A Republican has not won statewide in a, in a straight up election uh, in California in almost 20 years. This was a recall election. Enough people had been, been angry, at least for a while, against Gavin Newsom for shutting down the state uh, in a more severe way than anybody else. We have a real homeless problem. People are leaving. The state for the very first time in 170 years. So I thought maybe, just maybe, finally the voters had hit rock bottom and they were beginning to rethink their assumptions. As you know, in California, we have super majorities of Democrats in both houses of our legislature. Uh, and uh, uh, you name the brain dead, job killing policy uh, after another, and the legislatures have been passing it. So I thought maybe, just maybe, this might be a wake-up call for California, and that's why I jumped in. Uh, and in eight weeks, I raised $27 million. Uh, I, I finished number one against all the other 45 replacement candidates. I got three and a half million votes. California has 58 counties. I carry 57 to 58 on the replacement side. The only one I lost was San Francisco, and I lost that by 149 votes. So for somebody who never run for office before, uh, I thought it was a really, really good race. So uh, I finished the race. I go to Florida. A bunch of people there are buying me drinks, buying me meals, and they're all saying, why don't you run for, for, for president? First, I thought they were smoking something. Then I realized that the more I thought about it, the more I thought, frankly, it'd be easier to be elected president of the United States than to be elected statewide as a Republican candidate uh, in California. And I'm doing it because I'm an America first guy. Um, I'm a MAGA guy. I know we have a guy who's America first, who's MAGA, but there's some issues that our side is not talking enough about, if at all. Number one, the epidemic of fatherlessness, which is the biggest domestic problem facing America. Number two, we need an amendment to fix spending to a certain percentage of the GDP. Otherwise, government gets bigger and bigger no matter who's in charge. Even Barack Obama and Bill Clinton called the so-called entitlements programs unsustainable. This lie that America is systemically racist is not only driving uh, blacks to vote Democratic, which is what the Democrats want. It's getting people killed. Cops are pulling back all over America. And as a result of this lie that the cops are engaging in systemic racism against black people, there are thousands of dead people who otherwise wouldn't be dead if the police had been doing their normal proactive policing. And I know our party supports school choice, but I don't think we've made the case about how bad things are K through 12. Just to pick one city, Baltimore, there are 13 public high schools in Baltimore, I kid you not, where 0% of the kids can do math at grade level. If I can get the party nominee to talk about an amendment to fix spending, fatherless the lie about America being systemically racist, and to elevate the conversation about school choice, then I feel I've given back to my party, and more importantly, I've given back to my country, and that is why I'm doing this. Uh, what's it like been on the ground so far? You've been uh, obviously uh, out and about trying to trying to get, uh, sway some voters those early voting states right now. Uh, what's been the response? But believe it or not, one-on-one, -on -one, and when I give speeches, I, I get standing ovations. Uh, people know that I'm talk talking about the truth. I'm, I'm giving people common sense, uh, whether it's on the borders, whether it's on gas prices, whether it's on inflation. Uh, and reception has been really good, which is why I was so angry that I didn't make that first debate. Had people heard me, heard my, my father's story, he never met his biological father. So being raised without a father is not necessarily a death sentence. Left home at the age of 13. My father cleaned toilets when I was growing up, started a little cafe in his uh, late 40s, ran it until his 80s. My dad retired. He owned the property where the cafe is, property next door, plus a little home that's still in our family. Not too shabby for an eighth grade dropout. And my Republican dad always told my brothers and me, Democrats want to give you something for nothing. When you try and get something for nothing, you almost always end up getting nothing for something. And that's why I've written a book about him and written a book about California called As Goes California, my mission to rescue the Golden State and save the nation about what would happen to your state if you adopted the horrible policies that our politicians in California have been adopting for for decades what's been what was missing in that first debate and as we go into the next debate clearly at this point it looks like that field's going to be much smaller 
Well, I, I hit all the criteria for the first debate, 40,000 individual donors. I needed to submit three polls where I was at 1% or better. I did. Last minute, Ronna McDaniel calls me and says, you can't use one of the polls because it's affiliated with Trump, referring to the Rasmussen poll. Rasmussen put out a statement and said, no, uh, we're not affiliated with Trump. There's no reason why Elder can't use us. So we submitted a fourth poll, but they said you submitted it too late, which is true because I didn't realize I needed to submit another one. But they finished their polling before the deadline, so there was enough wiggle room. The RNC could have put me up there if they'd wanted to. And not only was I not allowed to debate, they put up a sign at the door saying to security, if Elder shows up or if his team shows up, don't let him in the building. So now I've made the RNC terror watch list. All right. Uh, Larry Elder, the website again, please, sir. LarryElder.com. LarryElder.com. Good to see you. Good luck. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. God bless. And the Final Five is back right after this.